right, welcome to part five on our segment related to African art. Um, in this section, we're going to be looking at a Lukasa memory board from the Budi Society of the Lumba people, which is um, the, located in the Democratic Republic of Congo. So while Europeans may open a history book to learn about their past, in the Lumba Kingdom of the Democratic Republic of Congo, history was traditionally performed, not read. So again, we have to consider that Africa has um, an oral tradition as opposed to a written record. In fact, um, Luba royal history is not chronological um, and static as um, Westerners learn it. Um, rather, it is a dynamic oral narrative which reinforces the foundation upon which Luba kingship is established and supports the current leadership. This history is also used to interpret and judge contemporary situations. Special objects known as Lukasa, or memory boards, are used by experts in the oral retelling of history and Luba culture. The recounting of the past is performative um, and includes dance and song. The master, who has the skill and knowledge to read the Lukasa, will utilize it as a mnemonic device, touching and feeling the beads, shells, and pegs to recount history and solve current problems. And so you, you see here a contextual photograph um, demonstrating that. The Luba Kingdom um, was a very powerful and influential presence from the 16th century to the early 20th century in Central Africa. Um, their art highlights the role that um, objects play in granting um, the holders the authority of kingship and royal power. The Luba people are one of the Bantu people of Central Africa and the largest ethnic group in the Demo the Demo the Democratic Republic of the Congo. The Kingdom of the Luba arose um, in the um, Pemba Depression, which um, is a large marshy area comprising of some 50 lakes in what is now the Southern Democratic Republic of Congo. The Luba had access to a wealth of natural resources, including gold, ivory, and copper, but they also produced and traded a variety of goods such as pottery and wood sculpture. Lukasa. Um, for the Luba people, kinship is sacred. Uh, kingship is sacred, and the elite um, Budi or Mabudi society, whose members are considered um, men of memory and who have extensive religious training, use the Lukasa to recount history in the context of spiritual rituals. Diviners who have the power to predict the future can also read the Lukusa. Each Lukusa is different but small enough to hold in the left hand. The board is read by touching its surface with the right forefinger as seen in the photograph. Um, the tactile qualities are apparent. The Lukasa illustrated here is one of the oldest known examples with carved geometric designs on the back and sides and complex clusters of beads of various sizes whose colors have faded over time. The board is a narrow at the center making it much easier to hold. The Lukasa is typically arranged with large beads surrounded by smaller beads or a line of beads, the configuration which dictates certain kinds of information. This information can be interpreted in a variety of ways, and the expert might change the manner of delivery and his reading based upon his audience and assignment. The most important function of the Lukasa was to serve as a memory aid that describes the myths surrounding the origins of the Lumba Empire, including um, um, recitation of the names of the royal Luba line. Um, so our next artifact is a reliquary guardian figure. Um, card figures that reflect African religious views on the cycle of life and death, and specifically um, the link between the living and dead. And we've, we've seen that theme um, in masks as well as um, sculptures. In Gabon and adjoining regions in Cameroon um, and the equatorial um, Guinea, um, the spiritual connection between the living and the dead takes physical form through rel reliquaries. Um, and these, as you remember, when we looked um, at uh, um, Romanesque art um, in particular, I remember they would create churches um, to, to house these um, reliquaries or relics, um, which were the bones of saints. Um, in Africa, these are containers for the pres preserved pieces of skull and bone um, that represent important ancestors such as the founders of extended families and villages or women who have borne many children. 
the living family not only honors the dead with ceremonies and gifts, but through prayer and ritual, they also consult the deceased or um, significant on significant matters such as warfare and infertility and preventing illness. Um, reliquary guardian figures protect the irreplaceable relics that link the living to the dead. Most of the people in this region, um, the Fang, and you're looking at um, you're looking at one from from that. Um, region, um, place the figures atop a bark um, box, like a, bar a box made of bark or baskets holding um, the relics. Um, the mabete um, place the relics inside the torso of the figure itself. So again, there are different variations on these guardian figures or um, reliquaries. Um, objects with the same function can dif um, differ greatly in appearance. And considerable variations in proportion, style, and surface treatment of the carved wood are notable among um, the various um, cultures um, that use them. Um, again, some of the figure carvings are much more abstract and serve as a foundation for the addition of metal decoration. So um, sometimes these... Um, valued metals like um, iron and copper um, that embellish these carvings serve two purposes. Um, they signify wealth, thus honoring both the dead and the living members of a family, and deflect the, harm the harmful int intentions of others. Um, so in this particular um, one that you're looking at, um, the object is a male ancestor figure carved from a single piece of wood, um, and again it's wearing a thick um, copper alloy necklace. Um, and this is again from the Fang um, culture um, and it's a masterpiece um, by a known artist or workshop. Um, you can see stylistically it's been reduced to a series of basic shapes, cylinders, and circles. The legs and hips are conceived as the intersection of two per perpendicular cylinders echoing the cylindrical reliquary box on which the figure sat. Um, Fang reliquary guardian figures are among the ritual objects um, used by the Bi'iri, um, an association devoted to honoring ancestors in order to obtain their goodwill. These figurative sculptures were placed on top of bark boxes containing the bones of rever revered ancestors. Um, such as male founders of villages and women with exceptional spiritual powers. These ancestors, um, the great um, personage pers of the local lineage, were called upon to assist the living in social critical problems and in dealing with issues of importance to the village. The appearance of the Fang reliquary figures, again, vary greatly from region to region. In general, the artists who created these figures apparently were interested in depicting the ancestors through individualized features such as a, as hairstyle and adornment, detail of the head, include, um, including carved crests and hair extensions, refer to plant fiber wigs or hairdresses once worn by the fang. Men and women wore these wigs, which were elaborately ornamented with cowrie shells, um, glass beads, buttons, and brass tacks. Uh, many, relic, many fang um, reliquary statues feature adornments of brass or copper alloy. Um, and again, this is, you know, becomes a status and signifies wealth and prestige um, because of its um, ties um, to long, um, this idea of long distance trade. Um, the shiny metal is also associated with daylight um, and may have been applied um, to the figure. Um, to strengthen its defenses against intruders of the night with the forces of evil, where the forces of evil are thought to be stronger. The shiny eyes convey spiritual power and added drama when the figures um, were used in rituals. So here you can see them in use. These are a couple of um, reliquaries from the Fang people of Cameroon. You can see that they, they sort of have that projecting stem and the flex knee pose allow the sculptures um, or the guarding figures to, to be sort of set upon a box um, containing these sacred relics. Um, and, and really, you know, they vary. Um, there's, you know, a degree of sophistication in the coordination of these sort of bulbous forms. Um, the neck is often massive. Um, 
Again, there's an emphasis on the cylindrical form. The arms usually have various positions, hands clasped in front of the body, sometimes holding an object um, held in front of the chest or attached to it, resting on the knees um, in the seated figures. Um, the navel is often exaggerated into a, a cylindrical form. Legs are short, stunted. Usually there is um, a dome, um, wide forehead, and the eyebrows often form arcs with the nose. The eyes are often made of metal roundlets. Um, the Bayuri would be consulted when the village was to change location. When a new crop was planted during um, a pal palaver, or before going hunting, fishing, or to war. But once separated from the reliquary chest, the sculpture object would lose its sacred value and could be destroyed. The ritual consisted of prayers, libations, um, and sacrifices offered to the ancestors, whose skulls would be rubbed with powder and, and paint each time um, with its large head and long body and short extremities. Um, the Fang Bayiri had the proportion of a newborn, thus emphasizing the group's um, continue um, continuity with its ancestors and with the three classes of society, the not yet born, the living, and the dead. Um, the relics were essentially skull fragments or sometimes complete skulls, jaw bones, teeth, and small bones. All right. Um, so now we're going to be looking at our last um, object. Um, this is a veranda post, and I have forgotten to put the label, so give me a second. Sorry about that. So what you're looking at is a veranda post um, by a very famous African artist named um, Aloe of um, Ise. Um, he died in 1938, um, and he um, uh, was part of the Yoruba people. Um, and he sculpted this um, for the palace of the Ogaga, king of Akiri. Um, and so it was, a, it was meant to be a sort of architectural element. You can see here it was sort of like the railings or the posts that you would see on a porch, um, or in this case, a, a veranda. Um, and so here you see some other ones and how it would have been displayed. So this veranda post is one of four sculpted for the palace at Akiri um, by the renowned Yoruba artist um, Olawe of Ise. It is considered among the artist's masterpieces um, for the way he embodied his unique style, including the um, interrelationship of figures, their exaggerated proportions, and the open space between them. Uh, while the king um, is the focal point here, and the king is actually this little, this little figure, <laughs> um, he, his portrayal suggests a ruler's dependence on others. Um, the stately female behind the figure um, is, a, is, is representing um, the king's senior wife. So it's sort of the opposite of what you think. Her large-scale impose um, with the hands on the king's throne underscores... Um, her importance. Um, so this is sort of an unusual depiction of a king. Normally, you know, they, they would be the largest figure. They would probably have the more elaborate um, regalia going on. Um, but here you, you see this, this theme of dependence or that the king is, um, you know, is needs his people um, and his entourage to support him. Um, and then the figure of his senior wife, again, because um, you know, she, she has her hands on the king's throne. Um, it, it's supposed to underscore her important, importance. Um, she had the critical role of placing the power-invested crown on the king's head during his coronation. Um, moreover, the senior wife um, used political acumen and spiritual knowledge to protect the king's interests during his reign. Um, you'll also see that there's some small figures at the king's feet, um, and they represent... Um, they represent um, some of his junior wives, um, a flute player, um, or a trickster god called Isu, and a fan bearer that is now missing um, from that has obviously broken off or damaged in some way. All right, so here's some better details. It was hard for me to find some details. Um, so it is this one is really important because this is an actual known artist. Um, remember a lot of um, African art um, because they didn't have an oral because they have an oral history. A lot of this stuff was not written down, so a lot of the 
um, artifacts that we've seen are anonymous. Um, but um, Oli was um, very famous, um, and, and he was very sought after um, in terms of a sculptor. Um, in its figural style, iconography, and the circumstances of its production, um, this architectural sculpture um, belongs to the court um, that um, to the court and the king that has informed the art um, of the Yoruba for centuries. Um, the Africanist William Fogg has referred to the artist's responsibility for its creation as the best and most original Yoruba carver of the 20th century. So he had quite um, a reputation. Oluwi was born um, in a town um, and it was one of the great centers of Europa carving at the turn of the century. At an early age, he moved to Ise, a village to the southeast. There, according to um, Fogg, this historian, Oluwi became um, an a mess, E-M-E-S-E, -E, or a messenger of um, the king, which um, they would refer to as Aranjal. A R I N G J A L E. Um, and he became a messenger um, for many years until his death in 1938. Um, he had great fame in the area as a carver of architectural sculptures such as doors um, and veranda posts. Um, Aloe was a master of composition. He had what in Yoruba is called um, a Jonah or design consciousness. O J U O N A O N A. Um, this term refers to the artist's sensitivity to form and to the relationship of the form to subject. Um, in the um, artistry of all the way, surface ornamentation complements formal properties. The scale and boldness of Oluwi's figures permitted him to carve elaborate hairstyles, which you can see on the figure of the senior wife to incise intricate decorative patterning on the bodies and to depict multiple strands of waist beads without um, diverting attention from the sculptural subject. So he was able to really incorporate a lot of um, elements but still keep the sculpture very unified. Um, of the three veranda posts commissioned, this is the one, this one is the, the center post of the outer courtyard of the Palace of Ise, um, and it was considered the most important um, it was the focal point of attention um, in the structure. Um, Aloe's skill as an artist revealed itself in his sensitivity um, for composition. Um, despite the openness of the sculpture of the king and queen, the clear separation of the figures, the sculpture... The, the, um, because, because there is such a negative space between the king and queen, the sculptor still succeeded in relating them to one another in this idea of higher ar ar arctic format. Um, in this work, a diagonal line intersects the vertical relating the royal couple to one another. So let me kind of go back um, to the full-scale image. Um, for example, the line of the queen's jaw is picked up in the tail of the bird, um, forming a graceful curve with its counterpoint to the bird's bill as it touches the crown. The diagonal line of the queen's breast continues in the jawline of the king and is repeated in the lower arm of the king and queen. Um, the pattern of the layer of beads around the queen's wrist um, is reiterated in the beaded pattern of the crown. Um, through these visual associations of line and pattern, Oluwi convey to the viewer the couple's intimate relationship. And so what they're saying is it, it, instead of, um, it's, it's unified even though there's this like a lot of negative space that, you know, these different sort of diagonal lines um, sort of unify the figure and the sculptures. So it really is quite an exquisite work. I've actually seen this in person. Um, it's located um, in Chicago at the Art Institute of Chicago, and it really is um, quite amazing. So that concludes our segment on African art. Um, there are quite a lot of really good Khan Academy videos that I put in your resource folder that I would watch um, because I feel like I've kind of glossed over um, some of this. Um, so if you want a better understanding of some of these works and appreciation, I suggest you look at those videos. 
Um, in our next video, we're going to be moving back to West. Well, we're, we're going to be looking at global art, but we're going to be looking at contemporary global art um, from 1980 to the present. So hopefully um, you'll look forward to that. Stay tuned.